This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Good morning, gang. Welcome to this beautiful, well, September morning. Seems like August has uh, been going quickly. I don't know, kind of slow parts of it. And uh, we've gotten through a lot of heat. We've gotten through a lot of uh, of uh, weather, right? But uh, now here we are in September. See what it has to bring. You know, even though we, this is the first day of September, I do want to remind you that it's still summer. Uh, still summer. We still have at least 22 days of summer. Uh, hopefully, it'll be getting cooler. I, I've noticed some of these mornings are a lot nicer than they used to be. Um, but now, we definitely have to to, to step back and, and not be too adventurous about thinking that uh, we're out of the clear as far as the dog days of summer goes, because it's still going to be warm. But we'll see. So, uh, this morning, give us a call if you've got questions going on in your landscape. you got these late summer, early fall questions. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we need to be doing ASAP as soon as possible. And if you uh, want to see what you need to be doing in your landscape, give us a call this morning at 706-865-3181. Uh, but if you'd like to uh, join us in other ways, we are streaming live on WRWH's Facebook page. And uh, also carrying that over uh, to the uh, Lanier Nursery and Gardens page. So wherever you may be, you can go back and forth and find some discussion going on there this morning. And hopefully we can help answer your questions on Facebook as well. But uh, if you're traveling um, in any time this, uh, this month, don't forget that you can listen to WRWH on the TuneIn app. Uh, there is a station there on TuneIn app. You would just download it wherever you get your apps from. And uh, you'll be able to, um, to to listen to our any of the programming here at WRWH while you're away. So don't forget that. And also, if you've missed anything, uh, if you say, "Well, I want to see last week's show or hear last week's show," rather, um, you can go to YouTube and look for WRWH. Um, of course, and be sure to subscribe there because you'll get the latest updates as far as what's going on uh, with WRWH and their YouTube channel. So there's a lot of ways to listen, a lot of technology out there. If you, uh, like I said, can't uh, hang on to the radio, uh, there's other ways to listen with that device that hangs around in your pocket, your smartphone. Folks, I want to remind you um, that this is pretty much the last weekend Pretty much the last weekend for safe fertilizing, pruning, and watering. Any of these things, fertilizing, pruning, watering, it encourages growth. It encourages um, the plants to produce new uh, green leaves and branches and things like that. And we don't want to do that; those kind of actions too close uh, to our first frost date because what will happen is this fresh growth uh, can get damaged by a, a frost, by a cold spell. So we, we have a good six weeks, really, before the average first frost, which is um, October 15th. And so Labor Day is always like the moment in the fall. Anything you want to prune, anything you want to fertilize or water, go ahead and do that now and try to encourage a little more growth and let it get hardened off um, for the next six weeks before we go into the um, the cool season. So, again, if you'd like to uh, have us answer a question or some kind of issue that's going on in the landscape, feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181. And uh, this morning, I'm going to go kind of in and out in between questions with a little discussion uh, on what I experienced this week. I was able to go in, uh, to a, an entrepreneurship conference, actually, uh, something different than gardening for a change, in Nashville, Tennessee, the home of country music, the city of, <laughs> of good vibes, you know, because they do have some great music down there. But in addition to great music, I didn't really realize how much gardening they actually have in the city and around the city. And there are three gardens that I'd like to talk about this morning. Uh, maybe I'll tease them out throughout the show. Um, 
But it's amazing when you go to a city, you see the culture, you see how different it is from where you grow up or where you live. And it definitely is different than the Atlanta area. Um, but Nashville, you know, it has historic sites. Uh, just like we do around here. They have urban sites, which, of course, we do in northeast Georgia, and the biggest one being Atlanta, of course, um, and also what I call active living sites, which would be communities of some sort, or resorts, and there are plenty of those around here in the northeast Georgia mountains. And I'm going to talk about all three of those and how I experienced those in Nashville and the types of gardens uh, that we have, um, or that we see, rather, there in um, uh, historical sites, urban sites, and active living communities, whether that's um, where you live at a, at a uh, neighborhood or in a uh, resort-type situation. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that, hopefully, in between your calls this morning, 706-865-3181. We are taking all of your questions this morning. So to talk a little bit about the uh, Nashville Gardens, the first one that I was able to experience was a historical garden, and that was at the home of Andrew Jackson uh, called the Hermitage, or Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, which is uh, the name of his house there, um, kind of near, uh, I guess it was uh, Hendersonville, out that way. And anyhow, you can see with uh, Andrew Jackson's historical site that there are a lot of older type plantings. And actually, the gardens themselves are not as old as the house, even though the house was somewhere in the early 1800s um, before the Civil War. Uh, it was built then. We, we see that the garden that is existing there now was actually put in in the late 1800s when the uh, house became a, a, a museum. And there are some gorgeous plants there. There's, there's a big influence with a, a particular plant which we've kind of grown accustomed to but in the late 1800s uh, this was a new plant and that's called crepe myrtle and crepe myrtle quickly became um, an icon plant for the south and it's easily reproduced which means nurseries or gardeners themselves can make cuttings or uh, take a root, uh, sprouts from the roots because we know how suckery they can get and there's a lot of those kind of crepe myrtles out there and of course boxwood some some hedging but in the middle of the garden <clears throat> Uh, you'll find uh, tombs, actually, which is something you, you won't see in some of these other types of gardens I'm going to talk about. But in the in the garden uh, that's there on the site, there is a tomb. There's, and it encases, um, of course, Andrew Jackson and his wife, Rachel. And there are other uh, burial sites there near the tomb, um, including one of uh, Andrew Jackson's slaves. His name was Alfred. He was uh, born there on the plantation. And uh, even through emancipation, he hung around. And the funny story about Alfred is even after emancipation and after the house became a museum, um, he was allowed to stay on and live there. And he, he was like one of the first uh, uh, what they would call interpreters today, but basically a guide of the museum. And so he's buried out there. And you can see how, how important plants are. Uh, when it comes to these kind of burial sites, because, of course, we have the garden uh, right there in the middle of this burial site, or rather say the burial site is right there in the middle. And so we don't see that a lot these days, of course. We have legislation and laws that say where people can and cannot be buried um, and how, on what size acreage uh, tract they can be buried on. But here's an example of a historical site where uh, where our loved ones are buried are included with a garden kind of, um, I don't know, is that morbid? I don't know. It's just the way it is. You know, this is just uh, part of life and things have changed. So that was one of the first gardens of Nashville that I'd like to present this morning is, of course, um, Andrew Jackson's Hermitage and uh, how it is a historical garden, including plants dated around 1890 uh, when the site first became a museum. And that is, it's like over 120, uh, nearly 130 years, I think, that this uh, site has been a museum. So very interesting and wonderful landscape and grounds. Of course, outside of the true gardens, uh, there are more gardens, I would say, which is more of a landscape feel, landscape uh, garden, meaning large trees, um, grassy areas. Of course, wildflowers, uh, things like that. And, and that was pretty iconic for that age, of course, in areas that uh, you didn't have crops growing. Uh, you would have this kind of open meadow kind of feel with uh, natural 
feeling elements to it, not so refined like you would find in the uh, design gardens there at uh, Andrew Jackson's house. So keep joining us. Keep uh, keep writing down your questions this morning because we want to help you answer. Of course, you can go to Facebook and we can you can find us there. Uh, if you want to ask a question, go ahead. But if you want to call us, give us a call at 706-865-3181. And this morning we go to the lines with a friend of ours, Gordon, who is over at the Farmer's Market. How are you this morning, Gordon? I'm doing fine. And you know what? I'm glad you were talking about Craig Myrtles when I was uh, – I called in and I've been listening to all of that. Last week when I was waiting to go on air, you were talking, you were saying, what is your favorite, what was your question, favorite, uh, you know, plant from the past, yeah. or the most memorable plant or, or something along that line. And I wanted to say crepe myrtle. And I thought, well, that's just to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just to everybody knows crepe myrtles. But, uh, but the reason I, I, I think Craig Merle is special to me is because of the uh, my, both of my grandmothers had Craig Merle right. in their house, and I just associate that with childhood. You know, just growing up and beautiful Craig Myrtles, and they were they might they bloom forever when you're a kid. They do. You know? yeah. so, anyway, so Craig Myrtles, Craig Myrtles would be my favorite family, um, favorite old time plant that I love. But over here at the farmers market this morning, we have uh, two kinds of corn, by color and white. Uh, we're getting low on that, though, so if you want some, come on. Great. We've got tomatoes. We've got okra. We've got watermelon, purple hull peas, figs this today. Figs are coming in. We've got green beans uh, and squash, peppers, and uh, then the usual flower arrangements. We've got two sets of people selling flower arrangements over here in beautiful oh. uh, pots and so forth. They look really nice. Wonderful. Uh, wood turning, uh, w- uh, cards, signs. We've got goat's milk products like soaps and stuff. And unusual today, which is the only time we'll have it, and if people are interested, they need to come over and talk to him. A, a, a gentleman from the University of Georgia is here, and he has samples of lavender that he's giving away, but he's doing uh-huh. a survey. And I guess they're doing some research on lavender, right. and lavender has become a, a very popular um you know, a commodity these days. You see more and more lavender type things. So, if you've got questions about lavender, today would be the day to come over to the market and and ask him some questions. Wow, yeah, that's kind of great. Yeah, I had heard that the University of Georgia was working uh, with lavender uh, to try to increase its potential to becoming a crop. Of course, in Georgia, it's a little too humid for that crop. It'll last some time, but it is a perennial plant. Um, but our humidity and all can uh, tear it, t- take it just straight down to the ground. Um, so um, I, I, that's what uh, I understand. So that's kind of cool to know that he's down there. Maybe I'll need to stop by after the show and uh, meet that yeah. fella. I wonder if it's if they've developed a hybrid version because I think of uh, yeah. lavender as growing in fields in south of, in the south of France. You know, right, those big big fields of mm-hmm. lavender that uh, Van Gogh and other painters that were down there, you know, painted in the past. So. That's right. But yeah, anyway, we have that humidity problem here. But it sounds like you've yeah. got some great uh, offerings down there. And you know, I was mentioning earlier in the show, Gordon, that uh, you know it's still summer, even though uh, it's September. It's still warm enough, and still, I mean, we're going to continue to be able to, to to purchase these fresh fruits and vegetables for some time, right? How long will we? I think so. I, I was co- talking to the to the farmers just before, and uh, we've got a, a nice offering of things coming in still next week. I'm going to be listing those. People can check their White County News, but we'll, I'll okay. be listing some of the the things that we're expecting at the market uh, on September 8th, which is next Saturday as well. So. Okay. Oh, come on great. down, and, and, and we, we, uh, we'll be here till 12. All right. Well, the last thing for those who are just joining us, can you remind everybody how to find the market uh, here in Cleveland? We are. You asked me that last time, and I didn't do a good job, so I'm going to be better okay. this time. All right. Give me a shot this time, Gordon. <laughs> we are on the – if you're in downtown Cleveland at the historic courthouse, and you take 115, like you go to Clarksville, you drive about 100 – yards at the most at probably 200 feet and you'll take a right there at freedom park and freedom park lies between uh 129 and the methodist church on the right side of the road going towards clarksville from the square okay all right well thanks for joining us gordon as always we appreciate the farmer's market update and we're looking forward uh to these fresh fruits and vegetables and all the other many crafts and products that are available there so y'all have a great uh-huh. time this morning we will Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Gordon. 
All right. Well, thanks for that update, of course. And we are going to be right back with more of your gardening questions at 706-865-3181. Join us on Facebook Live, too, to get a little uh, in-between break commentary. So we'll see you in a few moments. Check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturday mornings at 9 on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Well, welcome back, gang, boys and girls. We appreciate you hanging through the commercial break there in order to um, uh, listen for more gardening goodness and inspiration. We hope we can inspire you this morning. We hope that we can uh, get you excited about getting into the landscape. Of course, I don't have to work very hard because when you have a nice, uh, cool, warm morning like we're having now, uh, that can inspire you just as much as anything, probably more than anything I could say. Uh, But this morning, if if you're looking out there through the landscape, and you're, you, maybe you're out there in the landscape, hopefully you got your little earbuds in listening to the show here, um, and you see some problems, you see some issues, okay, um, I want you to give me a call or send us a message. You can call us at 706-865-3181, or you can also... Um, Email us, info at wrwh.com. And lastly, if you want to join us on Facebook, just go to WRWH's Facebook page, and you'll find that uh, there's a place you can comment. And if you don't want to call in, of course, which we'd love for you to call in, uh, I'm having a problem here. If you want to call in, that's that'd be great. But um, it's doing it again. Um, so uh, anyhow, I, I do want to go to my personal mailbox here because this morning I was working on... Um, answering an individual's question with his, he has some hostas and Scott sent this in. Um, he sent me some pictures. Okay. And I'm going to describe this as, as best as I can in his image here, there's hostas and near the, the base of the hostas, the basal part of the leaves, there's this kind of growth of this frothy, yellow, foamy, um, uh, c- composite. Okay. <laughs> well, w- the, the reason I'm kind of delaying my speech here is because I want to go ahead and tell you that it's called um, dog vomit mold. Okay, dog vomit mold. So to get a better idea of what this looks like, that that's it, dog vomit mold. Okay, it's not dog vomit, and it's an, it it is a slime mold. We call it, which is kind of uh, in between two types of it's, it's not really a fungus and it's not really bacteria it's somewhere in between they've kind of moved it around but this um, slime mold that's commonly called dog vomit um, mold will actually work on dying or decaying matter particularly like mulches and that's where it can start but it can also ooze and move around just a slowly creeping like frothy foam does um, onto the plants as it's trying to uh, reproduce and sporulate we would say which basically is like a flower goes to goes to seed well these um uh, slime molds go to um, uh, these slime molds go to uh, to spores, and um, so anyhow, this how, how do you treat it? That's the big thing. Scott's got these pictures that's creeping up on his um, his um, uh, the hostas, but the reality is is it's not working on the hostas; it's working on the mulch around it. So it's kind of an interesting concept, but but. You don't really have to treat it. You can take a high-powered water hose, don't kill the plant or damage the plant, but try to spray it off because it should come off pretty easy if it's in a slimy phase. But if it's already kind of dried out, it may be a little harder, um, and it may be more like powder uh, to scrape off, something like... um, you know, that quick insulation foam, how you, you, you stick it in wherever you're going to insulate and it foams out. And then as it hardens, it kind of, you have to scrape it off if you're going to uh, try to remove it. So you may have to do a little bit of scraping, but I think a high powered uh, water hose would work pressured water hose, I mean, and uh, just keep in mind that what it's doing is it's working on decaying the mulch around the hosta, Um, even though 
it looks like dog vomit. Doesn't look that pretty. It's not damaging the plant um, unless it shades out the plant. You know, it's covering the the leaves of the plant and it's shading the plant. If it's that bad of a problem, you may take some serious uh, look at what you can do to get it off. Um, but other than that, you should be able to just spray it off and uh, let it crawl on the ground. Uh, you can kind of remulch if you like, but. You, <laughs> The reason the mold is grown in the first place is because the mulch is staying really moist and wet. So you may not want to apply extra um, water that's not needed. If you have an irrigation system and it just runs twice a week, well, you may not need that. Um, so kind of back off on any extra irrigation uh, you've got there. So anyhow, uh, that would be the uh, slime mold known as dog vomit mold. Very interesting uh, concept there. But... Anyhow, so that hope that answers Scott's question. And if you have a similar question, um, feel free to go ahead and give us a call at 706-865-3181. Or you can mail us info at wrwh.com. Now, earlier in the program, since we've answered a question this morning, um, we were talking about uh, gardens of Nashville, Tennessee. And why? Because I um, was just there this past week. And so that was exciting and fun on, on a little conference there. But I was able in between courses and classes to go and visit some gardens. Of course, uh, we've already talked about the historical garden up there. It's called Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, which is the home of President Andrew Jackson. And we talked a little bit about that in the first segment. But um, then I want to move on to urban gardens. And this is something that we're increasingly really going to have to, to learn more about because as, whether we like it or not, folks... Um, the urban areas, and I don't like it, but the urban areas are encroaching into our rural landscapes. So where, you know, the uh, historical site at, uh, at Jackson's Hermitage is more of um, a rural landscape, the urban landscape is ever encroaching our way. And in Nashville, there's several areas and several ways that they use plants and they use gardening around the city to not just beautify and to give people a place of, um, um, you know, relaxation and comfort, um, but also to, to actually increase ecology. And I noticed some of these right off, uh, right off the bat. If you're down in Nashville, downtown, and you go to where the symphony is, or the uh, there's kind of a there's a park in between the symphony and where the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame is, and it's like a a nice, well landscaped area. There's a, a big lawn where they could have uh, guard, uh, shows and concerts and things like that. But around the edges and in between walkways and things, there there are plantings, and many of the plantings were uh, native plants, and so you can see that they're already using ecology down there. Whether it's trees, there were several native uh, shade trees out there, including uh, tulip poplars, um, some uh, elms, and uh, there was also uh, some zelkova which is an interesting um, street tree, good for shade, of course, but it has very vertical branches, great, great for a street, tr street tree. And uh, these areas, of course, aren't just beautifying the space, but they're also giving people a place um, to to relax. Now, unfortunately, I mean, there was a lot of homeless people hanging out on these steps. You know, that's just the city of, that's just the city, you know, that's the urban side. Uh, but uh, other than that, you, you did have people who were in, commuting or going between offices to lunch or wherever, and they were, they were being invited into the landscape. They were being invited into nature. Okay. So, um, you know, there is a, a quote maybe I've used before, um, but it comes from a, a, a Tom, Thomas Rayner, who actually is a l modern landscape designer, I guess you may put it. And he's in, in, in um, building up steam in some of his philosophies of how we should grow and things. And in particular, he, he talks about, he quotes as saying, or I'll quote him as saying, um, in the future, um, nature will be more like a garden basically and it's so true because because humans are building into where the woods are and we've always done that of course but we're going out into the forest land and the woodlands we're going to have to realize that hey we got to replace what we take out with something we can't just have concrete and steel we've got to have green material somewhere and I think that the city of Nashville has done a good job at doing that, incorporating nature as a garden uh, into the landscape of the city 
So, if you're ever down in that way, you may go visit the Country Music Hall of Fame, and you'll see this kind of area I'm talking about, and around the symphony. Um, that's kind of just one of the, the big areas that I noticed. But, of course, there are... Um, Horticulture all throughout. One way uh, that they were using horticulture in the city was with hanging baskets. And every street light that, uh, you know, there's very ornamental street lights, I would say. Very, very pretty and, and nice, not just, just for lighting. But they had huge, probably 20 inch hanging baskets um, hanging off either side of the. Um, of, of the street lights there, so that helped to add and increase the um, value of horticulture in the city. So it's good to see cities that are working with gardens and plants and horticulture instead of just, like I said earlier, using concrete and steel. We definitely don't want um, all of our areas to be covered with these kind of impervious, meaning water cannot infiltrate through uh, these these surfaces. So having green space is very, um, very important. But this morning, maybe you want us to help you with your green space. Feel free to give us a call at 706-865-3181. And uh, if you want to send us a message, just like this person did here, do so at info at wrwh.com. This morning, let's see here, we have a message from, yep, here it is. This is the one. This is the one right here. Jackie. Jackie says, I've got some tropical plants outside that I'd like to bring indoors through winter. What do I need to do to make this happen? Okay, this is a good question because we're really getting close to the time that you're going to have to make a decision about your tropical plants, Jackie. First of all, we want you to uh, lightly trim any branchy plants. If there's a plant that's really branched, uh, you would want to go and trim those back some, just enough to control the size. If it's a, a tropical hibiscus um, or maybe a, a tropical fig, uh, ficus, uh, we would call it, you would want to go ahead and trim them down to size. They'll grow a little bit between now and then, and, and you could also fertilize. That would be uh, the next thing, would be to, to fertilize it. Um, and if your plant is in the ground, Okay, I should mention this. Now would be a good time to take it out of the ground and put it into a container so its roots can get growing um, and you can bring it inside. But if it's already in a container, you don't have to worry about that step. But I just want to make that clear that if you have this plant that's in the ground, then you want to put it in a container and and, and bring it out uh, so you can bring it inside the house rather. Now... <clears throat> Other than trimming and fertilizing it, there's a couple of things you'll want to do. As our nights get cooler, okay, and really I would expect that to be more like in October, so you've got a month or so. But as the nights get cooler and we get down into the 50s, okay, if we get into the 40s, it's really getting too cold. But if we get in the 50s, go ahead and spray um, your plant with a product that I would recommend. It's called Bonneem, which is a neem oil plus um, a natural insecticide. And it will help to prevent, uh, get any diseases that may be there or particularly insects off the plant. It'll either suffocate them or take them away from the plant so you're not bringing them into the house when that time comes. That's one thing that we forget. About a week before you're going to bring it inside, go ahead and spray it with Bonneem, um, and that'll help control any pests that may be there. And of course, you can find Bonneem at the nursery that I work at, Lanier Nursery and Gardens, uh, conveniently located in Oakwood, Georgia, just about two miles off of uh, 985, uh, as it exit 16. So you can find us there and find some Bonneem if you're looking for um, control of these disease uh, insects and whatnot. Lastly, until that time comes, what you need to do is decide where you're going to put the plant when it comes indoors. And um, most of these plants will require as much light as possible, so a sunny uh, sunny area. Um, indirect light is okay generally, but maybe it's on the western, eastern, uh, sorry, western or um, southern side of the house. You'll see a lot of light there. And uh, I think once you do all these steps, Jackie, you'll see success and you'll be able to bring your baby in for the winter protector and uh, she'll be able to go right back out in the spring. So, this morning, we are answering questions, of course, and uh, we are doing a lot of fun things, talking about gardens in Nashville, so hang on tight. We, of course, have Ethel, an inter a special interview with Ethel, and actually her husband. So, if you want to hang around for the next half hour, we'll be having that, and, of course, my plan of the week. Give us a call, 706-865-3181, and we'll be right back with more of your tropical or planting questions.
Check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturday mornings at 9 on WRWH. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Well, folks, this is Let's Get Growing, and I am Nathan Wilson. We are here at our next half hour of the program, and we've already talked so much about, of course, the... um, the farmer's market located here in Cleveland, which is running uh, this morning, and you can go visit there at Freedom Park. Also, we've been talking about Gardens of Nashville, which we talked about a historical garden near Nashville, which is Andrew Jackson's hermitage, his home site, and the president, uh, Andrew Jackson, and of course, um, an urban garden, which is just scattered around um, the city of Nashville, particularly near the Symphony House and... Um, the uh, uh, forget it. The Country Music Hall of Fame, but um, we are going to talk a little bit about active living gardens that I noticed there near Nashville. Um, but before we do that, we have a special um, we have a special time here um, where I was actually able to instead of Ethel submitting her uh, soliloquy, I was able to interview her, and her husband was actually there. And so go ahead and let's uh, hear this interview and learn more about the couple, Ethel and Bill. And now it's time for a garden interview with Ethel and her husband, Bill. Because gardening alone is not nearly as much fun as gardening with the ones you love. Well, thanks so much, Ethel and Bill, for joining me this morning for a quick interview. I um, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. We're so glad to be joining you, aren't we, Bill? Bill. Bill, baby. Oh, uh, hmm, uh, y- yes, dear. We-, we are glad to be here. Well, well, I'm glad to hear it. I was just hoping that we might be able to chat a little bit um, about how enjoyable it can be uh, to garden with a partner. Oh, absolutely. Well, I remember the first time I saw Bill. He was actually hoeing a row of Crowder peas. He was so handsome and good-looking, with a little sweat on his brow and... And, and, uh, and how do you feel about that? Well, he doesn't grow Crowder peas like he used to. So, so, Bill, uh, how many years have you and Ethel been happily gardening together? Well, well, let me see... We've we've been gardening together for uh, about um uh, sixty two years, but I I guess about four of them were happy. Oh, Bill, come on now, aren't you such a card? <laughs> oh, I see. Well, that's good to know. Uh, so I suppose with all of these years of being together, you probably have plenty of good gardening stories, right? That's right, Nathan. We've got. Plenty of stories. Well, just the other day, our youngest grandson was eating a slug. Oh, boy, was I surprised and disgusted. But after regaining my composure and my lunch, I asked him, James, what do slugs taste like? He looked up at me and said, worms. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my, that is interesting. How about you, Bill? Uh, Any good stories? Well, well, uh, l- let me see. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, James's brother, um, Matthew, was helping me harvest some potatoes uh, a few years back. And, and after I had showed him the proper way to harvest potatoes, I, I asked him if he had any questions. He said, yeah, yes, I have a question. What? What I want to know is why you buried the darn things in the first place. (laughs) (laughs) Well, uh, isn't that just a shame? I think kids really need to know about where their food comes from. Fresh, local, and safe food. That's important, don't you think? Oh, yes. I I think it's very important. As a matter of fact, Ethel asked me to go to the market and buy some organic vegetables just the other day. So so I went down to the market and, and was looking around. I, I, I spotted a clerk there and said, These vegetables are for my wife. Have they been sprayed with any poisonous chemicals? He said, No, sir. You'll, you'll have to do that yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, William, I'm getting tired of this. 
I told you to be on your best behavior, but here you go on and on and on. Okay, and okay, guys. Uh, let, let's try to stay focused here. We we just have a few moments left. So it sounds like it's been great to be gardening together all these years and getting out and getting your hands dirty and growing fresh fruits and vegetables. Is there um, any other last story you'd like to tell? Well, yes. Um, one spring morning, Bill and I were in the garden looking at the flowers we had just planted. As luck would have it, a bird flew over us, leaving his calling card on my clean white shirt. When I showed Bill, he replied, without missing a beat, he said, You know, sweetheart, they sing for most folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys for joining us. Take care now. <laughs> Well, we are so glad to have that interesting interview. I don't know what's going on anymore. I don't know. What, but uh, it is a good point that um, uh, Ethel and Bill bring up. You know, gardening together can be so much fun, whether that's with um, your significant other or whether that's with your children, or maybe your grandchildren. Um, gardening with someone can be enjoyable and you can learn from each other and learn together. Uh, you know, and, and more than that, also make memories. Make memories. I particularly remember um, with my grandmother, I call her Nanny. She and I used, when I was a kid, we would fill her gardening boxes with, um, oh boy, all kinds of plants year after year, annual plants. Of course, these would be uh, annual bedding boxes and we would have Celosia or Vinca or whatever, Periwinkle, maybe another name you're familiar with. And I remember us going in, putting in our potting mix and digging in the plants. And of course, we would have a few hanging baskets and whatnot at her house. So that's always um, fun and exciting to remember um, how you, how, you know, it, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say that uh, I don't want to get too sentimental here, I guess, but I just want to say that if you're gardening with someone, you're making memories and you're not just building your relationship with the garden or with the soil or with the land, but you also are with another human being, someone whom you love and they love you. So this morning, of course, we are answering your questions at 706-865-3181, or you can send us a message at info at wrwh.com. You've got mail. This morning, I think it's important for us to answer this particular question here because um, this particular question has to deal with uh, pruning. Betsy says, I've heard that fall is the best time to plant. Sorry, best time to prune. I said that wrong. It's the best time to prune. When can I start? Okay, Betsy, you have heard that, but you have heard it incorrectly. Someone has told you incorrectly. Fall is not the best time to prune. I think that came around as a myth because it's getting colder, right? And it, we shouldn't prune plants when it's warm. We should prune plants when it's cold, right? Because they won't have as much stress as, as, as we think they undergo. But all of that thinking really doesn't show up in the research. What the research says is that, um, first of all, there's no good time to prune, okay? There's no good time to prune, uh, meaning that Every, no matter when you're pruning, you are damaging the plant. You are creating a wound. It's as if you were taking a knife and cutting yourself. Uh, it just hurts. It's not good. It has to heal. And so that's what we're doing with plants is we are cutting them with shears or loppers or some sharp tool, maybe, maybe a, a handsaw. And so we're inflicting this damage. Well, that plant has to have time to recuperate. It has to have time to heal itself, just like you and I would if we accidentally cut ourselves. Now, what that means is the best time to plant, even though there's no good time to plant, uh, sorry, prune. Why do I keep saying plant? There's no good time to prune. The best time would be when the plant is actively growing. Okay? So if the best time is when the plant is act actively growing, that would basically be from spring all the way to Labor Day. Okay? And I've already told you at the beginning of the show that this weekend, Labor Day weekend, is the last final weekend to do any kind of pruning or fertilizing and uh, some of these activities that encourages growth. Because when you prune, it will encourage growth. But also, you want the plant to have some time to heal over that wound before it gets cold. Here's the problem. In the fall time, the plants are dormant, Right? Either they've dropped their leaves or they're dropping their leaves. They're going into their their uh, winter sleep, we may call it, right? Their, their plant hibernation. And uh, I like that, plant hibernation. Anyhow, so I amuse myself. 
So while they're sleeping, they're not going to be growing and they're not going to be actively healing themselves. So what happens, uh, Betsy, is that you have a wound that is carrying over all winter long, which is open and not healing. It's susceptible to uh, water uh, getting onto the wound, uh, water freezing uh, it, as we go into the cold season, causing winter damage. And so all of these things are not very safe, which it can all lead up to fungal rots and bacterial rots, etc. So the big issue is um, that you don't want to prune any later than now, actually. So, Betsy, that's a great question. There is no good time to prune. The worst time to prune is fall, but the best time is when the plant is actively growing spring through Labor Day. I hope that answers your question, Betsy. And if you're listening to us this morning, uh, perhaps you have a question. So feel free to give us a call this morning at 706 865 3181 and we will be right back with more of your gardening questions. Check out live editions of Let's Get Growing Saturday mornings at 9 on WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. All right. Welcome back, gang. This morning, we have had so much fun and excitement um, that we can barely control ourselves. I'm going to talk about the last and final garden that I noticed in Nashville over the week while I was there for a conference. Um, But before we do that, um, we've already mentioned that we've got the plant of the week uh, here. And um, of course, I've already gotten that together earlier in the week. And we're going to let you listen to it now to see what type of new plant you may not know about that will work great in your your landscape. Today's plant of the week is brought to you by the Aster family, the family of plants that contains the most plants in the entire world. Today, however, we're going to talk about one aster that has really only been popular in gardens since the Great Depression, common sneezeweed. Sneezeweed is a great plant native to the United States and attracts a wide variety of native bees, butterflies, and other pollinators with their gloriously bold petals. I've seen one plant completely covered with a slew of small native bees, as a matter of fact. Why should you care, you ask? Well, common sneezeweed will give you beautiful tones from yellow to orange to red to mahogany and will fill the center or back of the perennial border with its wonderfully branched and winged stems. The flower color contrasts very well with the fresh greenness of those said stems and leaves and the brown and blackness of the flower centers. Sneezeweed can grow from 3 to 5 feet tall. However, there are some awesome cultivars that have proven to grow much shorter. Sneezeweed is going to love it in the sun and will thank you for it by blooming from late summer into fall. It's also a great choice for areas that stay moist as it does not prefer to dry out. So, if this is such a great and gorgeous plant, why in the world would it be given such a weird name like sneezeweed? Well, there are a couple of stories that might help explain this. One says that because sneezeweed blooms around the same time as ragweed, it has been mistakenly identified as the culprit of your sneezes. Yet, another story suggests that many years ago, the flowers were dried, powdered, and used as snuff. Thus, sneezeweed. If you're looking to spice things up in your landscape with something new, try Common Sneezeweed. It's beautiful, native, and always available at Lanier Nursery and Gardens. Common Sneezeweed, a true gazunite for the perennial border, and it's my plant of the week. All right, everybody. Well, we do appreciate you uh, listening in this morning. Uh, That is a wonderful plant. I don't want to say any more about it because you've got all the information you need there in that segment. Um, But if you have questions about it, feel free to give me a call, 706-865-3181, or you can send me a message, info at wrwh.com. And also, we have a lot of folks joining us on Facebook Live this morning, and there are um, some questions coming through, as a matter of fact. How, let's see, Kim says, how much shade does a native azalea need? Okay, great question, Kim, because a lot of times we think that native azaleas need shade because they do naturally grow in the understory <clears throat> underneath a high, high, high shade, we call it, which just means large oaks, hickories, pines, wherever, uh, whatever forest uh, you have, you'll find some native azaleas growing under there. Well, the reality is, Kim, that we actually bring these azaleas out into cultivation we bring them out into cultivation, and they 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 just flourish. They flourish. They they get more sun. Um, generally speaking, now uh, they they get more sun. They bloom more. 
and they make an all around um, nice, what's the word, structurally sound plant. In the shade, native azaleas can be a bit scraggly looking, so kind of wild looking, but in the sun, they create a more bushy, uh, thick um, appearance. And so it, they can actually add a lot of landscape to a sunny site. Just keep in mind, Kim, if you're going to install these types of plants into your landscape, that uh, azaleas have very shallow roots. They do not have very deep roots and they do not like um, very wet soil. So don't place an azalea in a wet spot and don't plant it too deeply. Uh, I saw a case where an individual planted um, the plant two or three inches below the root ball, which it caused root rot all the way around, um, not just in the roots, but up at the stem and just girdled the stem as well. That So keep in mind that they do like to spread outwards, so dig a very wide hole, but they don't have to be planted very deep at all. So how much shade? They can take sun to shade, Kim, if that help, answers your question. But feel free, if you have a question, uh, you're on Facebook, you can type it in if you want to call me, 708 706- 6-865-3181. And um, we've just got a few more minutes, so I'd like to talk a little bit, um, maybe before we take another question, about um, our uh, final uh, garden um, that I experienced in Nashville. I mentioned earlier the historical garden, uh, which was Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, and they had a landscape and, of course, an uh, English-style garden there. Um and we had a urban garden, which was pretty much just the city of Nashville. Um, there were certain aspects of the city there that um, were just uh, beautiful, uh, to, to say the least. And also the last one, and here is the one that I always visit. I always visit because it's free. Um, you may just have to pay to park. But this is the active living garden is what I call it. <laughs> it's a resort. And it is the Gaylord Opryland Hotel, uh, resort hotel. This particular place is located outside of Nashville where the new um, Opry House, the um, uh, Grand Ole Opry House is, uh, where the old Opryland was. And now there's a shopping center and this uh, Gaylord Resort. But here's the beautiful part about it. You know, it's very very nice place very very um i'm sure you would have to to you know trade a child to go spend a week there but it's okay because in, instead of just having outdoor gardens they have created these glass conservatories okay and so if, if you're you know rooming there with other people and you're on different wings of the, the hotel you go from one place to the other place through um, there's these conservatories full of plants that you and I just can't grow up here in the Northeast Georgia mountains. Uh, well, you could grow them indoors, of course, but you can't grow them really outdoors all year long, but full of tropical plants. There's a lot of folks who are growing um, fiddle leaf figs. I actually have one myself. It doesn't look so hot, <laughs> but uh, I'm trying. Uh, fiddle leaf figs are really kind of chic, I guess, right now. They have these Fiddle-shaped uh, leaves, that's where they get their name, liar shape, we would call it. And they're just beautiful, gorgeous, uh, dark green uh, fig leaves. But, um, you know, in a house, you, they can only get so so big. But out there at the, um, the Gaylord Opryland uh, Resort, where they're growing under glass in a conservatory, these things are are as like two stories tall, at least 20 foot tall, some of these uh, plants. So some of these plants like Dracaena uh, is another tropical plant, um, another tropical plant that we use indoors. Th- these things were over my head, over seven, eight foot tall. And so you can experience waterfalls. They have, it's, it's highly um, manicured, of course, which is okay because it's a garden, right? And it's cultivation. So if you uh, consider all of these things about the active living garden, you know, maybe you live in an area where uh, there's a company that oversees the grounds. Well, that's great for you. You know, you're able to go walk trails or walk along the pathways and experience wonderful manicured gardens, beautiful plants. But maybe you don't live in, in a place like that. Maybe you are the head gardener <laughs> who is manicuring and, and making these, establishing these beautiful landscapes and gardens. So th- think about that. These are these active living gardens are where we live or where we work, um, in between working and living, or where we um, recreate. And these are the types of gardens that we can help build and grow and develop, and they can turn into something wonderful. So, folks, um, 
This morning we've talked about these gardens of Nashville, of course, the first one being a historical garden with Andrew Jackson's Hermitage. We see influence from the old days, 1700s, 1800s, and uh, still they're able to to, uh, preserve that. Um, If you want to see a historical garden here in our area, just go visit um, the Longstreet Hotel, the Piedmont Hotel, Longstreet, General Longstreet's Piedmont Hotel in downtown Gainesville um, off of MLK uh, Junior Boulevard, and you'll be able to see uh, plantings that aren't uh, existing to the site, but plants that could have been used around the time Longstreet was here in Gainesville. Uh, Also, urban sites, of course, any of our uh, urban spaces. We have beautiful little towns here um, in the North Georgia mountains, including uh, Cleveland, just beautiful areas uh, downtown and outside of town that you can see these things. And active gardens, go to your very own backyard. Go to your very own backyard and find what's beautiful to you and go ahead and get your hands dirty and get growing. Folks, um, this morning um, has been a great time to chat about gardening, about growing things with you. And I hope that if you have questions, uh, you may jot them down this week because you can join us next week, the same time, 9 o'clock, at WRWH. Of course, we are streaming live on Facebook every week. um, And also the Tune tune In app is a great way to do it. But, hey, if you've missed the the most of this show, feel free to visit YouTube and uh, just search for WRWH 93.9, and you will be able to find old uh, shows and this show just within 24 hours or so. So feel free to join us. Let's get out there in the gardens this morning. Get out there in the gardens. Get your shovels dirty. Get your fingers dirty. And let's get growing together. I'm Nathan Wilson, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at LanierNurseryGardens.com. Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.